Hello, my name is Heather Quackenboss. I am the Human Development and Relationships Educator with UW-Madison Division of Extension in La Crosse County, and I am doing this presentation for the Wisconsin Association of the HCE, so you all can learn a little bit more about finding joy. And we're going to just think about today finding joy, and if you have someone who can pause the recording every once in a while so you can all think, that would be amazing. So first question to all of us is, what is joy? And if you want to pause here and give up, come up with some ideas, that would be great. And if you want to unpause or not, talk about it. A lot of times we think finding joy is searching for happiness. We're thinking we're supposed to be happy. And if we accomplish something, we'll be happy. If we get our windows washed, we'll be happy. If the dishes get done, we'll be happy. If we get that promotion, we'll be happy. And often as soon as we reach that level of achievement, we're happy for about 37 seconds and then we need to move up and on again. And now I'll be happy once I get the next promotion or the windows are washed, so now I need to do the bedding or the dishes are done, but they're never really done because someone always brings a dish in as soon as you're done with the dishes, right? So when we look, at finding joy, I want to remind us all that if we chase happiness and if we only allow happiness to be equated with our achievements, we will never actually find joy. So how do we do some of that? What we're going to do is just think, who are maybe some of our role models as we were growing up? possibly our moms, our grandparents, um, our, our family, maybe some friends, different teachers, different people we've had mentor us in our lives, whether we knew they were mentoring us or not. And of course, for a lot of us, when we think about home and community education, we think of Betty Crocker, right? Some of us still have that really old Betty Crocker cookbook that's binding is just coming apart, but it opens to that page that our family always made the recipes from. And Betty Crocker was always perfect, right? And sometimes we try to emulate that perfection and we want to be perfect as well. And I will just tell you for me, I can try making something look really pretty. I can try to make that pretty top pie crust. And often it's going to taste good and it's not going to look pretty like I wanted it to. And I can get very down on myself for that. We all can, right? Something doesn't work out the way we wanted it to. We can get down on ourselves. And then we start comparing ourselves with those people we think are perfect and that we should be. And now we don't measure up. And I just want to remind all of us, including me, that we're human. And there's eight signs right here that we are human. And starting up on the top left, we might, might not be prepared for every possibility. How can we be, right? We can try to think of it. We can try to plan. We can try to look forward to different things. And stuff pops up. We get surprised. We're not prepared. We might get sad for absolutely no reason. We're just sad. It doesn't even have to be a great icky day or maybe no one was even around us. We're just sad. We might say the wrong thing. Folks, I do this about 32 times a day, right? We say the wrong thing and we might get down on ourselves when in all honesty, that's a great time to learn and say, oh, wait a minute, that's the word for that now? Okay, I, I've learned something today. We might have weight fluctuations or health differences. It happens, right? We might feel unsure of what our next steps are. We can't plan everything, kind of like the top left corner over there, right? We might be productive one day and struggle the next. We have no idea what our energy level is going to be like or what's going on. Actually being productive is a success in a day. And sometimes just making it through a day is a success. We might feel confident or insecure, depending on the day. And it might be the same thing that we're doing. Things happen, emotions happen, and it just makes us human. And last sign that we're human is we, we change our mind. Sometimes we think something's going to be really, really awesome and good. And nope, it's not. So we've changed our mind. And that's okay, too. 
So going forward then, how do we do this? How do we manage this? How do we, you know, get up each day and do what we need to and want to do? And we're going to start by being very honest. And the picture that you see here is the compassion fatigue path. And any time we work with any people ever, whether we have family, whether we're doing some caregiving for family or friends, whether we are working in a human services or education or customer service field, or we are that customer and we're going to the store and trying to do things, often we come into any situation as a zealot, that top cat there with the little kittens. And we're committed, we're involved, we're available, we're ready to solve problems and make a difference. We are Mary Poppins, right? We are going to be the best ever in whatever situation we're in. And often we find that's not sustainable. So sometimes we get there and we have our rose colored glasses on. And then some days we're like, yep, it's going to be sunglasses today because I feel like throwing shade and we're not the zealot anymore. We might, in fact, roll on down to that grumpy cat there and get a little irritable. And we get to that irritability in the compassion fatigue path. This is where we're angry. We're cynical. We don't have as much creativity as we might. We can't think of new ideas. We're just always the, that's not going to work. And if someone else suggests something, that's not going to work. We're that that's not going to work kind of person. We might feel very sad or we might feel helpless or even hopeless. And this doesn't necessarily come across as us being able to say, oh, I'm irritable right now. This comes out usually in those weirdest moments. For me, it's when I'm driving. You know, I might be driving and maybe I had one of those days and I'm trying to just, you know, be okay. And then someone doesn't use their turn signal. And my goodness, then it just all falls apart. And so for me, I know that if I'm getting irritated with other people driving and more impatient than I might be, what else is going on? I might be in that irritable, grumpy cat phase. We might swing down here to withdrawal. This is where we are overwhelmed by complexity. We're always tired. We might have tired competitions with other folks. We might actually get sick. Because our bodies, when we're not doing well mentally or emotionally or socially, we can get physically sick. We might have difficulty empathizing to other people. We're like well, not understanding or not even caring that they're dealing with difficult things too. We might feel numb to other people's pain or we might have absenteeism where we're there physically and emotionally or mentally, we're just checked out. We're not going to even bother pretending. It's sometimes when we get into a meeting or when we're having a conversation, we're like, meh, I'm not going to deal with this. That's when we're maybe in withdrawal in the compassion fatigue path. We might swing over to zombie over here, that cat that looks like, oh my goodness, what's going on? This is a sense where we can't do enough. We have this inflative sense, inflated sense of importance if I don't do it, nobody's going to do it. Or nobody does it as well as I do. So I have to be the one to do this. And with holidays around or maybe caregiving or parenting, we've found ourselves in that, uh, that mindset sometimes, right? We might get sleeplessness. Things keep us up at night. How am I going to deal with this? How am I going to work this out? And we might have a sense of persecution because we're the only one who can do it and no one else is helping me, and we might start getting a little bit lonely. We bounce around this cycle. This is not a circle, folks. We don't start out at zealot and then go to irritable and then go to withdrawal. We might be zealot for the first few moments of the morning, and then we get to zombie, and then we move over to irritability, and then back to zombie, and then back up to zealot, and we're bouncing around there like a pinball machine. And eventually, we get to a state of unwell versus renewal. And this is burnout or that compassion resilience. So we might burn out. This is where we see people leaving professions and leaving helping professions like healthcare and education and human services, or even customer service or um, wait staff. And we get to decide here, I need to do something very, very different because I'm so burnt out that I need to change a lot. Or we get to a place of, okay, what can I do? What do I need to do? Because here's my life right now, and here's what I need to do to fix or change. 
So I'm going to ask you in your groups or if you're by yourself watching to just pause for a moment and look at where you might be right now. Where do you find yourself more often? Are you more zealot, irritability, withdrawal, zombie, or in that stage of burnout or hey, I'm, I'm figuring some things out. I'm making some different life choices and I'm, I may be figuring things out. And once you're done pausing or thinking about that, we'll keep moving on. One of the first steps to any kind of resilience, any kind of acceptance, any kind of trying to find joy in whatever situation we are in is recognizing and acknowledging our feelings. We might have a loved one who has a now difficult diagnosis. We might uh, have some people in our lives who have passed away. We might be dealing with some different financial stresses. And when we look at compassion resilience, when we look at finding joy in just our everyday lives, it's not just finding joy in those happy moments, it's finding joy in all of it. Not saying we need to silver line our clouds. What I'm saying is, when we acknowledge our feelings, we can start looking at them and looking at what we need. So with these emojis here, what sometimes we like to communicate with emojis when we text or do messenger or anything like that on social media, really just looking at, all right, what's the feeling I have right now? And for some of us, we feel those feelings in our guts. Some of us, it's in our hearts. Some of us, it's in our heads. But just to really feel that emotion that comes up when things happen. So if we're happy, cool, what's going on? What is some of the stuff that's going on that's helping contribute to that happiness? If we're angry, what is something that's wrong? What's missing? What do we feel we need to fight for? Or what happened to us that was not just? If we're sad, what is it that we're grieving? What are we missing? So all of those feelings, if you're like, mm, you know, my mom and my dad never taught me to really accept feelings. We're always supposed to be fine. And I know I grew up in the Midwest too. And it can be hard because we're supposed to always be fine and temperate and okay. And to acknowledge those feelings can, well, it can feel a little bit odd and weird because we're not used to it. Here's what I have to say to you for that. Feelings are just data points for what we need. So if we are feeling that anger, okay, what am I needing to fight for myself for? What boundary was crossed and that I need to figure out or ask for that? If I'm overwhelmed, do I need to ask for help? Do I need support? So really figuring out, okay, here's my feeling and here's what I need. And there's some really amazing resources out there on the feelings wheel and universal needs to help us really do that. So honestly, challenge for you today and every day is just take one point of your day, one moment, say, okay, what am I feeling right now? Feel it, allow yourself to feel it. If you need to cry, cry. If you need to yell, yell. If you need to punch a punching bag, punch that punching bag. And then, all right, what do I need? What does this feeling tell me I need? Another way to really help us find joy is to look at gratitude and find something that we are grateful for. And this, I know sometimes we sit around dinner tables and we're like, oh, everyone say something you're thankful for. And often we'll say those really big things, right? Like I'm grateful for family or I'm thankful that, you know, we have this house, which is great. And I'm going to challenge us all to find something teeny tiny little because then we actually can every day find that teeny tiny little thing. Is it the smell of coffee when you first wake up? Is it, you know, the sun coming up over the horizon? Is it when you get in the car and it's a little bit warm? Uh, is it when you look out the window and see a bird? One of the things that I started doing is to thank the tiny things. This is an image of traffic lights. And you notice that those traffic lights are green. I actually thank green lights when I go through them, especially when I might be running just a touch late, especially when I know that there are some lights in my hometown that uh, 
like to be red a lot more often than their green. So when I get that green light, I actually just say, thank you. Not that there's a green light, you know, essence that will help me get more green lights. It's just one of those things that helps train my brain to find the good things in my day, to find the good things that happen to me that I can be grateful for. And when we find those small things that we're grateful for, we actually teach our brain to find good things. We train it to look for good, to look for what we're grateful for. It's this wonderful concept called neuroplasticity, where we can train our brain to find that good instead of always looking at that negative. Another thing when we're looking at joy is to look at what our core value is. And all of us like to say we have a lot of values, right? We, we want to connect and we want to have courage and we want to be compassionate and we families of value and reliability and caring and kindness and community and volunteering. And there's a few words up on this screen for you that you, you can look at, but I'd really like you to think of right now, if you were to sum yourself up using one core value, one, what word would that be? And I'd even like you to just pause here and really think about what word sums my self up, mostly in totality, but it could be in your personal life or maybe professional life. And when you're ready to unpause and you have that, I'd like you to just think about what that looks like every day. So for instance, for me, connection is generally my biggest value. I want to make sure I connect with people in my professional life. If I'm teaching or facilitating, I want to connect so we understand each other and that we can learn from each other. When I'm home with my family, I want to connect so we have good moments together. Not all good moments, but some good moments, right? We know families can be tough sometimes. So for me, for connection, what that looks like every day is how can I make sure folks understand what I'm trying to teach. If I'm facilitating, how can we understand each other that this is what you're trying to say and this is what you want me to ask you questions about? When I go home, it might be shutting my computer down at work. It might be putting my phone away. It might be pausing when I'm doing the dishes and sitting down with those family members and saying, okay, let's chat. And the other thing is I, I have kids that are end of teen years into their 20s. And sometimes that connection doesn't mean looking at someone in the eyes. It means sitting next to them in the car, taking a drive or taking a walk or sitting while working on a puzzle, because then it's easier to connect with what we need to talk about. And we don't have to feel that awkwardness that comes along with it. So I've really looked at my goal is connection. How do I do that? So how do you live your value every day in those little moments? And I'll have you pause here. Just write three things down. What is it that you do every day to make sure you're living your value? And now if we're unpausing or you're like, yeah, I got this. I have this. I don't need to write this down. I'd like you to think of that value again. And I'd like you to look at what do I want to say yes to? So for instance, my value being connection, I want to say yes to spending time with the people I love. I want to say yes to being very authentic with the people that I'm with. And if, for instance, I say something wrong and they're like, oh, Heather, you just said this and this, this was kind of mean, I want to be able to learn from that so I can connect rather than getting defensive when I'm chatting with them. So I can say, oof, I, ooh, I didn't mean that. Thank you for pointing that out. I'm going to try to do better so we can keep that better connection in our relationship. So when I'm saying yes to doing those things, what might I need to say no to? And right now I'm going to ask you to pause again and challenge you to write down three things that you want to say yes to for making sure you live your value. And then I would like you to write down three things that you probably need to say no to 
in order to make sure you are living that value. So for connection, I might be saying yes to spending time with the people that I love. And I might be saying no to, you know, social events that come up or checking my email when I'm with them. So giving you a couple minutes to pause and to write those things down. And now we'll unpause again and we will look at something else that can really help us find some joy. And this is work by Tal Ben-Shahar. He is a positive psychologist out of Harvard and now has a happiness in science association. And he really looks at our whole being. So we hear well-being and we hear holistic health. And he came up with this lovely acronym SPIRE to help us remember different components of ourselves. So we have spiritual, physical, intellectual, relational, and emotional. So when we're going through here, we all have these components in our everyday life. Some of us look very different than others. When we look at spiritual, we might think religion, and that's perfectly fine. And some of us have a really deep, rich, religious upbringing and practice. This also can mean leading a meaningful life and mindfully savoring the present. So when we're looking at things, looking at what's what's my purpose here, or what is it that I love and how do I live that, that love? It might be really just looking around and saying, oh my gosh, look at that snow coming down. It's just so beautiful. And taking that moment and allowing ourselves to have that awe. Now, having kids in their 20s and late teens, they often try to look for their purpose. And a lot of us really will say, oh, I need to go out and discover my purpose. And what we really learned is our purpose isn't out there for us to discover. It's for what we love and how we use it. So my oldest son loved Legos all the time. And if you've ever stepped on a Lego, you will understand family's pain, right? With Legos in the house. He loved building Legos and building different cities of Legos. And then he loved Minecraft, which is basically a video game of building things on the computer, kind of like Legos. And we chatted about that one day and he said, I don't know what to do with my life. I like Legos and I like Minecraft. And I said, well, it sounds like you love putting things together and figuring things out. And so he looked at that and yeah, that's what I do love. So part of his purpose is to help figure things out. We go over to the physical and physical is caring for our body and tapping into that mind body connection. Now, a lot of you are like, mm, you're going to talk about diet and exercise here, aren't you? No, I'm really not. What I'm going to talk about here is what do you do for yourself that helps your body feel good? That might be getting outside. That might be walking. That might be, you know, doing something that might be eating different food, maybe for you. But what is it that you do? that helps your body feel good and you feel good in your body. That is the physical well-being and whole being. We move over to intellectual and that's engaging in deep learning and being open to experience. Now, before we all had phones and Google at our fingertips and we could look anything up, we might hear a song in a restaurant and we'd have a conversation around the table. Wait a minute, what's this song? Where have we heard this song? And eventually we would figure it out. It's a great example of just that intellectual practice. Now we can you know, tell our phone, hey, what's this song? And our phone tells us, it even tells us who sings it and what radio station is on the entire lyrics, which frankly, I think I've listened to lyrics wrong my whole life because they're never what I thought they were when I see them in print. Intellectuals really being open to learning, being that lifelong learner, reading books about things that you don't know about. I tend to read a lot of fiction because it helps me get into the feelings and the understanding of what people are going through in whatever situation is going on in the book. Intellectual might be learning something new or taking classes or, for instance, coming to groups and um, learning about how to find joy in your everyday. So intellectual is just always learning, that lifelong learning. Relational. Actually, this one, as we age, one of the biggest indicators of how well we will do as we age is 
the relationships that we have, the connections we have, those friendships we have. And it doesn't have to be a whole lot of ton of friends. It might be a few good friends or one really good person. So how do we nurture a constructive relationship, not only with others and those other people, with ourselves as well? I don't know about you, but sometimes I have those people of my past who might have been more critical of me, sometimes they still show up in my head. And if I'm doing something and I do it wrong, sometimes I hear exactly what they may have said to me as my own voice now. And so learning to look at, okay, how can I be compassionate to myself and be kind and tell that inner critic in my brain to maybe sit down and take a break for a while? How can I do that? And how can I have people in my life who have my back and I have theirs? And then we go to emotional, which we started this presentation with, right? Is feeling all of the emotions, all of the emotions and reaching toward resilience and optimism. And I will tell you right now, no emotion is a bad emotion. It's just an emotion we have. A lot of times emotions are fairly fleeting and they'll happen and we'll feel them and if we accept them, feel them, we can keep moving on. So allowing ourselves to feel all of those emotions and actually feel of them, not just intellectualize them and say, oh, I'm feeling sad and here's my need. Feeling it, moving through it, and then, okay, here's what I might need and here's where I need help. Now, how do we maybe mix all of these together? There's a couple questions for you. Is Who's your person? Who will help you no matter what? Because having a person who has your back or you can call about anything, you can call and say, hey, I need to just vent today. Or a person who you can call and say, I need you to help me find some solutions to this issue. Who's that person or those people? And I'm going to ask you to take a few minutes, write them down. They're important. Maybe give them a call or a text later today. Say, hey, thanks for being my person. Another thing is finding your glimmer. Sometimes we find things that trigger us or get us really mad. It's also important to know what our glimmer is. Where do we find awe? Where do we find those little tiny moments of joy? You know, maybe when um, the dew is on the grass in the morning and the sun's shining on it and it's sparkling, um, maybe smelling some really good tea. Maybe it's that first bite of our favorite food that we take. Where do we find that little part of awe that we can make sure that we incorporate that occasionally into our lives? And write that down if you can. My moment is what gives me joy or what makes me go, ah. Oh. Sometimes that's right after we finish something hard. Maybe it's just after we finally finish the dishes and before that last person comes in and puts a new fork down that's dirty. Maybe it's when everyone goes to bed and the house is just quiet for a moment. What's that ah moment? Knowing what that is can help us try to put more of those moments into our everyday. And that last one is my go-to coping skill. And sometimes we might have some maladaptive coping skills and they're not real healthy for us, but nevertheless, that's what we do. What's your go-to? Do you cry? Do you take a few breaths? Do you talk to someone? Do you make really sn snarky, sarcastic comments to a friend? Not necessarily the most positive coping skill, right? And sometimes if that's what helps us in that moment, we can then keep moving forward. So when we look at Spire and our whole being, sometimes we think that it needs to be a perfect pie and we've needed to cut it perfectly. And I'm going to tell you now, this is not pie because some of us have more than um, in one area than in another. And it might be, you know, a smattering of pieces around. The really awesome thing with this is if we say, you know what, I just want to work on one of these. I want to maybe um, nurture a, a better relationship with, with this friend. And I want to build that relationship and I want to become better friends. Once we start doing that, every other one of these pieces in Inspire is going to grow a little bit too, just by working on one thing. 
So when we look for joy, we really want to look at what works for us. So today, as I was talking and you were listening and maybe writing things down, what resonated the most with you? Take that and continue moving it forward. So whether it be acknowledging our feelings, whether it be finding our gratitude, whether it be looking at our core value and maybe learning what we want to say yes and no to and creating some more of those boundaries, or whether it's looking at Spire and saying, well, what's one thing I could maybe do? And honestly, all of these things are those tiny little things that we can do. I know that sometimes we decide to come up with really big, huge goals and often those kind of fizzle out after a few weeks. And if we do something really tiny and do it for at least 21 days, we're starting to create a new habit. And then when we do that and we're looking to, okay, I'm not going to look for that happiness or that achievement to be happy. I have to earn it. I'm just going to find those little moments every day. That's when we're going to feel a little bit better, no matter what our situation is. I want to thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, you certainly may contact me at my email. Otherwise, I know your HCE is an amazing resource and that you really do work on relationships and joy and all kinds of things there. And I hope that you have a very joyful day.